Season 6 opened with an episode about Ned Flanders possibly killing his wife and ended with someone shooting Mr. Burns. And in between, they packed that season full of mysteries and conspiracies. Season 7 unmasks the Mr. Burns shooter and finishes with Lisa learning something about herself on vacation. And in between, they filled that season with stories that were more relationship-driven, self-aware, and experimental. New showrunners Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein were transitioning the show in a new direction. The time to ask questions is over. Season 7 is about whether or not we're going to accept the answers. By now it feels like we know almost everything about these characters, and the same could be said in-universe. Everyone has preconceived expectations about each other. Lisa expects Homer to be ignorant of anything outside the status quo, and Marge expects Bart to be her special little guy. The big shift in Season 7 is how it leverages these expectations into new challenges. Is perception reality, or is there more to these characters than meets the eye? By far, the overarching theme of Season 7 is self-image and how people are perceived by others. Like, come on, it literally ends with Homer Palooza and Summer of 4 foot 2, two stories about characters trying to make others think they're cool. But you see this dynamic constantly throughout this era. Marge worrying about being judged by her rich new friends, Milhouse becoming the most popular kid in town, Troy McClure trying to rehabilitate his image, Homer being bitter about not being king of the neighborhood anymore. Character relationship storylines are often driven by false perceptions by others, or trying to change people's minds. The Flying Hellfish episode isn't about whether Bart actually loves Grandpa, it's about Bart appreciating him and not feeling embarrassed by that fact. It's all about image. Also treasure, I suppose. As a result, there's a ton of cringe humor throughout Season 7. You can't have people feeling self-conscious without embarrassment to some degree. Honestly, Season 7 feels kinda modern in this regard. The internet really latched on to poking fun at the embarrassing and awkward moments that people have. A show like The Office came along and basically rolled around in its uncomfortable moments. And sure, there were certainly awkward moments in the earlier years, but this is something Season 7 really championed. Think about how Oakley and Weinstein loved the Skinner-Chalmers dynamic back in Season 5. You knew this was going to be a style of humor that would trickle into their run. They'll bring in Bob Newhart to deliver this rambling, impromptu eulogy. They'll have the museum guy not understand Lisa's pun. Or maybe the king of them all, having Kirk Van Houten walk into the frickin' pawn shop scene from Pulp Fiction. Sometimes they would just let a scene go on for much longer than usual, basking in the glow of the vocal performance. That being said, there is definitely more of an observational bent to the humor in Season 7. Once again, think back to Oakley and Weinstein's earlier work. They weren't afraid of slowing things down and gleaming humor from the mundane. What's the deal with these kitsch restaurant decorations? Aren't computer keys weird? Look at these off-brand televisions. A lot of these observational moments I wouldn't describe as laugh-out-loud funny, but they're extremely relatable. You sort of smile at them and share a moment with the characters. I have personally been to like a dozen air shows and can attest that these jokes are very well observed. And it's not like they're just doing mundane stuff for the sake of it. There is an offbeat, non sequitur twist to their targets. Finally, the Simpsons got around to visiting the old Spirograph factory or watching the World Series of Sandcastle building. Even in that well observed air show sequence, here comes the box kites. Because of all this mundanity, this was not a particularly fantasy and flashback heavy season. They never got close to the levels of fantasies from back in seasons 3 and 4, for example. Not a lot of quote unquote manatee jokes during this period. I would say it's about as surreal as season 4 though. The David Merkin years really rebelled against unexplained and magical elements trickling into the show. Whereas here we'd get stuff like Maggie's head spinning around, an alien in a bunker, and God knocking over bowling pins. Seasons 5 and 6 would never attempt a story like Bart Sells a Soul. However, Season 7 did retain the Merkin era's subversiveness in its sense of humor. They didn't reach the dizzying screw the audience highs of the previous year, but I mean, who really could? Season 7 definitely held its own in this category. My favorite is probably this Don Brodka moment, a screw the audience joke with a awkward observational twist. A joke the guest star didn't even get at the time. I also really like this one about the two crusty stamps, one celebrating his career, one commemorating his death, where they overwhelmingly vote for the regular one. 
You can tell the writers are still playing leveling games with the audience. That whole, you know that I know that you know, this is the expected punchline. Sometimes they'll give us the wacky and absurd punchline, sometimes they'll opt for the more logical conclusion. Season 7 was a bit more sarcastic than the Merkin years, though. They seem to relish in portraying Matt Groening as this reclusive, far-right personality. Or they'll show Hollywood as this idealistic industry quick to give people second chances. Observational humor plus subversive humor equals a metric ton of sarcasm. Overall, it's a more self-aware brand of humor than in the past. Oakley and Weinstein were huge fans of the show before being hired as writers, and it really shows in their output. They love sprinkling callbacks to previous episodes. Jokes would be written with the understanding that the audience has seen certain concepts before. We all know that Smithers is going to pick Homer to be Mr. Burns' assistant. Let's lampshade it instead. It reached the point where Marge is literally commenting on the direction of the season while it's happening. I'm not personally the biggest fan of the Lester and Eliza ending, but I respect the hell out of it. It's so intentionally unsatisfying that the writers would dare strike back at the concept of Bart and Lisa solving every problem in Springfield. To be honest, The Day the Violence Died is kind of a fascinating episode in that it represents the two competing facets of Season 7's personality. First, appealing to the more tried-and-true traditional formulas, stuff like doing a yearly itchy and scratchy spotlight, or bringing in Lionel Hutz for an Act 2 courtroom battle. But secondly, it represents the experimental side of Season 7, trying out a bunch of new ideas we'd never seen before on The Simpsons. In the DVD commentaries, Oakley and Weinstein described how they consciously modeled Season 7's structure after Season 3's. That they looked at the mix of family relationship episodes, secondary character spotlights, and wacky adventure plots. You look at stuff like Home Sweet Home Diddly Dum Doodly, or Marge Be Not Proud, and yeah, they do have the feel of the early years. They filled the season with these character relationship pieces, Stuff that got the show back to the family and emphasized what they mean to each other. However, they would also do format bending stuff, like 22 short films about Springfield, or a sarcastic clip show full of deleted scenes and Tracy Ullman shorts. Or they'll do a simulation of George Bush living in Springfield, a pulpy action adventure story starring Grandpa and Bart, a legitimate status quo change. None of these episodes are even close to resembling season 3, let alone any other era of the show. Even in more traditional stories, they would try out new animation techniques, like digital coloring or 3D rendering. Honestly, I love that Oakley and Weinstein weren't afraid to try something weird with the show. Like, after the big, grandiose David Merkin years, there would be a temptation to revert back to only smaller, more character-driven stories. But they chose not to play it safe. They hit upon this beautiful balance of being accessible to Simpsons fans while still pushing the envelope in a major way. In terms of story structure, Season 7 stuck to mostly self-contained plot lines. We didn't see too many trampoline plots in Act 1, or these Act 3 treasure hunt swerves. We did get a few opening set pieces, I suppose, but these tended to be brief and transitioned to the main storyline organically. The neighborhood rummage sale transitions to a new neighbor moving in. A bear roaming through Springfield sets up the political atmosphere in Springfield. A more random opening, like the drag race, still manages to get called back to later in the episode. They love sneaking in small elements in the first two acts to pay off at the climax. Even the B-plots were deeply integrated into existing storylines. Homer playing golf against Mr. Burns could logically only occur in the Country Club episode. Uncle Moe's family feedback intersects with Bart's storyline. Same with the Homer Lisa stuff in Bart on the Road. The lone exception to this rule is the school uniforms B-plot, which got attached to a story about boweling. Still, they did a great job in Season 7 of making its plot points not feel interchangeable. Very rarely do these stories feel like two concepts crammed together during a pitch meeting. So far, I've talked about how Season 7 shifted away from the complex mystery plots of Season 6, but it's not like they disappeared entirely. You do feel the remnants of that era, especially considering Season 7 opens with Who Shot Mr. Burns Part 2. Let's not forget, here's where Sideshow Bob steals an atom bomb and Krusty fakes his own death. Season 7 preferred a more historical bent to its conspiracies, finding out what happened to Mona Simpson in the 1960s, the actual history of Jebediah Springfield, and the secret Hellfish Bonanza. 
They were really into tearing down institutions, challenging what we thought we knew about our favorite characters. I guess this isn't necessarily the most satirical season of The Simpsons, or at least not consistently so. They'll do a few episodes that's basically, oops, all satire, but then elsewhere there's barely a whiff of it. Just a bunch of dry cereal shaped like character relationships. Actually, I'm not sure if this cereal metaphor really works, because those relationships are what contains all the sugar in these episodes. Season 7 was more inclined to punch the audience in the mouth with sentimentality, really tug at the heartstrings, make us care what they're going through. It's like, after Do It For Her happened, they decided to triple down on the schmaltz factor. Some of the endings reminds me a lot of seasons 3 and 4, to be honest, how they would often wrap things up with characters walking away into the sunset. It's a cliche, but it works for a reason, I suppose. Season 7 was pretty balanced in terms of its guest stars playing characters versus playing themselves. There was certainly more of a Hollywood feel to this year, thanks to stuff like Radioactive Man, A Fish Called Selma, and Homer Palooza. This is a world where Paul Anka, Suzanne Summers, and Paul and Linda McCartney would show up in Springfield. What I love about its guest stars, though, is what an odd lineup it is. Like, they'll go super modern and bring in all these Gen X musicians, but then they'll bring in Lawrence Tierney, Mickey Rooney, Kirk Douglas, and Arlie Ermey. It's like, The Simpsons is tired of celebrating the 1970s and 80s, we're gonna do either super current people or these grizzled old veterans. They did manage to add two new secondary characters to its cast, Brandeen Spuckler and Disco Stew. Not too shabby considering how many seasons we're in by now. Both of these characters show up pretty regularly, even today. Not surprisingly, considering this season opener, that Mr. Burns continued his reign as the king of the secondary characters. Here we learn more about his background in the 1960s and World War II, and got a few power plant and social appearances to boot. Smithers benefited from these storylines too, we got to see a more determined and ruthless side of his personality. Krusty became slightly less omnipresent in Season 7. They featured him in the Sideshow Bob episode and Bart the Fink, but otherwise he'd mostly disappear. We saw much more of Chief Wiggum instead. Who Shot Mr. Burns Part 2 is one of his most prominent roles ever, and then he'd show up about once per episode. Other characters, like Apu, Selma, Troy McClure, and Grandpa, got individual spotlight episodes. In my opinion, there are two clear winners of Season 7, and both are at Springfield Elementary. First, of course, there's Principal Skinner. I mean, this is the steamed ham season. Of course Skinner is one of the big winners. Lots of great Chalmers stuff with him, naturally. Also, a bunch of little observational moments, Skinner trying to be devious, or trying to keep control of the school. Season 7 didn't have a ton of Springfield Elementary storylines in it, but somehow they managed to keep Skinner in the picture. However, if Season 7 was truly modeled after Season 3, then you know that the MVP of the season is Bart's friend. This is Milhouse's best year of The Simpsons ever. Yeah, I know he had a lot of great jokes the last go around, but here's where he gets full storylines, like becoming Fallout Boy, buying Bart's soul, or going on a road trip. Oh, do you want the cringe factor? Millhouse is all about that cringe factor. I mean, come on, he's the dud. Like, Season 7 loved Millhouse so much that they'll bring him in for a commentary over this old film strip. He doesn't need to be here. He literally has nothing to do with the story. That's just a testament to how much of a stranglehold he had over the writer's room. Season 7 treated us to a more balanced portrayal of Homer, dialing down his stupidity and rage a couple of notches, and boosting his emotional sensitivity. It's kind of funny we got the question that Homer gets stupider every year, because it's not really true in Season 7. His stupidity instead comes from misguided schemes, or him simply lacking awareness. Instead, they gave Homer more sympathetic moments, give him either a thoughtful character arc, or hit us with some powerful emotional moments. Or he hits Mr. Burns with another powerful emotion. Let's just say Homer was an emotional mess this whole year. Also, similar to Season 3, they leaned on the Homer-Lisa dynamic more. We get to see them as bitter rivals, best friends, and co-investigators. Lisa was somehow written more childishly and more adult-like in Season 7. She was in charge of investigating almost all of the mysteries, as well as framing the topic of the week for the audience. But for how high-minded she's written, she's still only 8 years old. She has strong beliefs about vegetarianism, sure, but has to learn how to tolerate other people's opinions. 
In other episodes, she'll get excited about ponies, ask Marge for some candy, want five bucks from Bart, or childishly demand her Christmas present. As a whole, I really like Lisa's characterization here. It's a nice combination of issues Lisa without writing her like a one-note stereotype. Bart's storylines tended to be more relationship-driven than in previous years. The show stopped teasing Bart every single week and instead systematically showed off his major relationships. Can Krusty forgive him? How does Bart relate to Homer? How do he and Lisa get along? And the rare unicorn of familial pairings, the Marge-Bart storyline. This wasn't a year about highlighting these huge pranks and stuff. Bart's not about making his mark on Springfield and Shelbyville. This was more about the grifting, the sneakier and more calculated schemes that invariably blow up in his face. Season 7 wasn't particularly nice to Marge, basically putting her in torturous situations or else have characters dump on her. However, this was a year where Marge would clap back, straight up tell people that they're being ridiculous. Even despite this negativity, Marge is kind of adorable in Season 7. They really perfected the naive Marge joke, where you roll your eyes at how out of touch she is, but appreciate that she's well-meaning. This is a Marge where a little LSD is all she needs. She does this so much that sometimes I wonder if she's doing it on purpose just to mess with people. The only concerning thing about Marge is how increasingly codependent she is with Maggie. Maybe child services were right to check in on them. Speaking of which, Season 7 is an awesome year for Maggie. You know, since we get to see her shoot Mr. Burns and all. But seriously, they did make an effort to include her in the storylines. We'll get to the climax, and suddenly she's swooping in to save the day. Good job, Maggie. Back in my Season 3 retrospective, I described that as the first sequel season, where they didn't need to build the foundation of what the show was anymore, that it became more about iteration and evolution. Season 7 unfortunately had to deal with being the sequel of the sequel. Or the sequel of the sequel of the sequel, if we'll throw the Merkin years in there. It had this heightened sense of self-awareness that reminds me of the HD era of the show, almost as if it's the first quote-unquote modern season. Now, I don't want this to sound like an insult to season 7, because I mean it's modern in the most complimentary way possible. What season 7 gains, by its very nature, is perspective. Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein did an outstanding job recognizing what dynamics had been explored before, what had been successful, and how to give the characters a fresh new look. It's not enough to have Homer and Lisa fight over his bad parenting. It's not enough to have one of Bart's pranks blow up in his face. The book has already been written on these characters. What we care about now is whether or not they can rise above these expectations. Honestly, I think that's why there are so many self-image storylines in Season 7. The characters still have a lot to prove, to each other and the audience. Somehow, The Simpsons didn't fall into a post-Who Shot Mr. Burns hangover. They continued to experiment, kept finding ways to show the audience something new. They hit that perfect balance of paying tribute to the past while always looking toward the future. To make a long story short, Season 7 is aged like the finest of wines and is personally my favorite season of The Simpsons. Let me know in the comments what you think of Season 7, and how you think its style compares to other seasons. Also, let me know about its fashion style. I was surprised how many iconic looks came from this era. I'll be back next time with my top 10 for this season, which I'm projecting to be one of my more contentious lists, but I think that's more of a testament to how many great Season 7 episodes have claimed to the number one spot. Or I have bad taste. We'll see. But as always, thanks for watching.